the surface. Uh, right. Who are you? Right. And um, you said that um, you started working at, mm -hmm. at a mill in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. uh, you were already already done with high school, or yes, I was done with okay. high school. Okay, and mm -hmm. but at some point you decided to go to college. Right. And evening. what was that process like? Well, from the time I was a junior high student, there was no doubt in my mind I was going to college. All right. And uh, how did you get that? Who? who? Well. <laughs> There's a little Ronald Reagan connection here. <clears throat> when my aunt was the homecoming queen at Eureka College in um, Illinois, she went on a date with Ronald Reagan. All right, and if you go out to his library, you you walk in and there's a picture of him dancing with a woman, and it's her. Her name's <laughs> misspelled, but it, it's my aunt. Yeah. And my uncle uh, was uh, on my mother's side. He was president of the alumni association at Eureka College, and my aunt until just very recently, uh, was on the board of trustees at Eureka College. And we had this kind of family connection to Eureka College, mm -hmm. and everybody worshipped Ronald Reagan, rightfully so. Right. And uh, it was just kind of something that the family thought was the thing to do, was to go to college, because I had an uncle who went, and then I had an aunt went, mm -hmm. and we saw it as a, a, a route to success in life. And uh, so it was just kind of a family thing. Fortunately, all the, way, all the way along, I had good enough grades or I'd have test scores or something, and people would say to me, oh, you're, you, you, sh you need to go to college, you know. You've got the, mm -hmm. the intellectual ability to do so. So I never thought any other way. And uh, when I was a senior in high school, I wanted an appointment to an, to an academy. And so at that point, our congressman there was Henry B. Gonzalez. Hmm. So um, I applied to his office and took all the exams and I got an appointment to the Naval Academy. But because I was in right, love, right. I didn't go. So um, that's kind of where the college thing came. And so when I went to work for this um, uh, paper mill, roofing mill. It was a company called Celotex. It was part of Jim Walter Holmes. They would give you a real small amount of money if you went to college, hmm. and as long as you worked there. And so I worked there and um, went to college in the evenings. Uh, I was also a church youth director about that time, and um, so I was a youth director. I was working full time, and I'm going to college, and. Um, Pretty soon we have a couple children, so it was pretty hectic. And that's kind of been my pattern all throughout my life is um, doing a lot of things and uh, being highly active. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't like to sit around much. And so going to college and doing all that stuff has just seemed the thing to do. And well, no other I, way of doing it. I mean, obviously, that one thing led to to the next, and then next mm -hmm. thing you know, you're working managing accounts in 56 countries. Um, oh, there was quite a quite a lot that happened between there. <laughs> <and then. laughs> yeah, we, uh, you know, I I love to hear if you want to share, sure. so we have an idea. Sure. Uh, after working at the Celotex, this paper mill and roofing mill, they made building products, primarily shingles and tar paper. Um, I was looking through a magazine that uh, was talking about another plant similar to ours that was built in Houston by Brown and Root. Mm. And so I, I, I read the story and I thought how much better it was than the one I was working at. So uh, I called up Brown and Root, sent over a resume, uh, got a call like a Thursday in the, and said, hey, can you come for Saturday morning for an interview? So I drove over there on a Saturday morning uh, interviewed and by Monday morning before I even went to work in San Antonio I had a phone call offering me a job. Wow. So shortly after that, uh, I think it was July of um, 1980, we moved to Houston. And that's when I started working at Brown and Root. And uh, at that point I was working as a supervisor for what they called power procurement, which was working on utilities, plans. We looked on Fayetteville out here in um, LaGrange area, mm -hmm. the Lower Colorado River Authority, 
we were also the South Texas Nuclear Project, and then also um, Comanche Peak up in Glen Rose. So I did that for, oh, I don't know, not quite a year, and the head of all procurement for Brown and Root um, wanted to speak to me. And so he met in my office, and I walked, or uh, my boss's office, rather, and I went in their office, and he said to me, We've decided that you're going to end up, you're going to head up our international procurement area. Mm. And I said, I've only been to Mexico. I, I've never even been out of the United States. <coughs> and so he turns to my boss and says, I thought you told me Dave was real intelligent. <laughs> and uh, so then I said, you know what? I think I really would like to do that. So I went from doing utility work and to international work. And immediately, there was a billion dollar project in Venezuela that I was uh, heading up a big part of it. And uh, so I did a lot of that international work for three or four years, primarily in the procurement, contracting, mm -hmm. subcontracting, logistics, traffic, shipping, all, all those kinds of supply chain. And uh, in 1985, I'm at that point, I'm 34, I'm the youngest senior manager of the they've had in Brown and Root at that level. And um, the vice president of procurement, uh, actually it was called material management, they had, uh, I don't know, several thousand employees in that division, came to me and said, I hear you don't like to fly in airplanes. And I go, no, 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 that's not true. He said, well, I, what I want you to do, just to prove it to me, go up to GPU, the people on Three Mile Island, they've, they've hired some of our contractors, I know, I've sent them up there, he said, I want you to see if you can get some more business. So I go up there on a trip, and I'm only there for two-thirds of a day, and they offer me a big job up there, <laughs> all right? And at that point, it was during the oil crisis, and uh, my, my little division had like 450 people in it, and I'd laid off all but 32. Wow. And, uh, um, and so as a result, I, they, they told me up there, hey, we're hiring people and you're going to grow the department and several times. And so my wife and I and my, our uh, four kids, we take off for western Pennsylvania. Mm. So we're up there for about um, uh, four years, I guess, at this point. And, and this is part of the story that gets me to the where I, I think I can explain to people why I make independent choices in spite of the pressures around me. And I told this story the other day um, to a group. And I was walking by these two procurement people um, in a cubicle. And the cubicle was just higher than their heads where they're sitting. And I heard one of them say to the other one, uh, I hope Dave doesn't find that file. And so I turned around, walked into the cubicle. And I looked at them and I said, and they both were white as sheets, and they go, what file? And they say, um, nothing. They just look at me. And I said, come to my office. So I took them down the hall to my nice little office and closed the door, and I said, what file? And they both start crying like babies. And that concerned me a little bit. Mm. And so um, I said, either you're going to tell me or I'm going to get the head of internal affairs at that point. And he had been... Um, I, I, he, I think he was the head of, um, previously, the uh, Pennsylvania State Police. And so finally one of them collected herself and told me what file. It was about a $12 million contract we had placed. And I had signed the contract. But they had changed the price, somebody had changed the prices, and the supplier who got it. Mm. So I went down to the executive I reported, and he had headed up the Navy nuclear program under Admiral Rickover. And he, he said, Dave, what do, you, what do you think it is? And I said, I, I think we've got a really big issue here. Mm. And uh, this is going to be one of those whistleblower moments, just so you know. And he says, that's what I'm afraid of. And uh, so he quits. He says, I'm not going through this. And uh, he, he said, now you're the boss. All right? So we do an investigation over a couple of days and we realized that the purchasing manager who reported to me had doctored the files. Mm. 
and he was gone. He was on a vacation, and so he came back, and um, so we call him in the office, and I start talking to him along with the guy with internal affairs, and he turns to me and says, they're going to kill us. He said, because the people that have, I changed it to are organized crime out of this part of the state. And um, uh, he said, they're going to kill us. So that Sunday, the supplier that he was talking about got shot 12 times and killed in his bathroom. So I, I kind of thought he might be right. And long story short, um, turned out there were about 42 people involved in this whole thing. A uh, number of executives lost their jobs. And, uh, but before all this started, as I was first walking to my boss with this file, I called my wife on the phone from the cafeteria and I said, um, um, I, I know what I found. I, I'd been around the block enough. I'd worked at Halliburton Brown Root long enough to know when some things weren't right. Mm -hmm. And so she said, you do whatever you need to do. The Lord will take care of it. And, uh, and he did. He did. But in those situations, it really calls for the courage. To do the right thing. To do the right thing.